Thank you. Where can I order the big poster from? The atmosphere is palpable, unbelievable, and my personal favorite, a strong case against the argument that something isn't pixel art if it's been made using dirty tools. <laughs> Whatever they are. Those are just uh, a few of the comments that we had on a Reddit thread about this screenshot when we, uh, when we put it out a couple of years ago now. I'll put it back for a second. People love hype, right? We've all been aboard the hype train however many times. And hype is kind of hope, kind of hope plus excitement. And I think also hype is often a way to connect with people. So yeah, people got pretty, pretty hyped about this. And um, I think there's two kinds of hype. And I'll go into a bit more detail on, on those later. Um, but first of all, I'm here today basically to prop up the bar ferociously network and uh, shamelessly self-promote, but also, <laughs> also to talk about navigating hype as a small indie and, and also how to create it. So quick introduction. I'm from Odd Tales. We're a new, small, independent studio based in South London, and we're working on our debut game, The Last Night. So the studio was actually founded by two brothers from Paris, Tim and Adrian Serret, or Serret, or however they say it. And uh, I managed to convince them to, to come over to London and, and move in with me. Um, the two of them were actually, Tim had a career as a, a very successful kind of motion and graphic designer, uh, motion designer for kind of big, uh, luxury and entertainment brands for many years and Adrian's is his younger brother who's been an artist all his life and about two years ago the two of them decided to start collaborating on a kind of Ghibli inspired dark fantasy cinematic platformer-esque pixel art game bit of a mouthful but that's what they were making it's called Behind Nowhere and it's actually going to be our second game in the end because near the end of 2014 the itch.io cyberpunk game jam rolled around and the two of them thought, yeah, we'll give it a shot. And uh, it didn't do too badly. Actually, in the end, it placed first overall, so it won the thing. Um, it also won, well, it came first for aesthetics, and 31st for relevance. So I don't know if that means that we were ahead of our time or behind it, I don't know. But uh, either way, yeah, it did okay. It did okay in the end. And. Even though it sounds obvious, I think straight away there's a, a bit of a lesson there, which is never to be too attached to whatever you're working on. You know, don't be too married to one idea. Those guys were working on Behind Nowhere for ages, and then this opportunity came along, and quite rightly they decided to switch focus to something you know, a bit more topical and a bit more achievable. And as Tim said in his interview with the fantastic Jessica Condit of Engadget, um, after the game jam, we received an insane amount of attention. Was absolutely not expecting it whatsoever. Why? Well, we've asked ourselves this uh, for quite a lot of time, actually. It's quite humbling. Why did so many people, I mean, there were, there were threads from the game jam on, on Reddit, NeoGAF. It got picked up by all kinds of online press, even print press. It was crazy. Why? And we think we know now. It's because we touched a nerve. You know, we wanted to make basically a modern flashback or a new kind of odd world game, you know, that we just didn't feel there was. And uh, yeah, in the end, it looks like quite a lot of people agreed. But the cool thing as well was that even though they thought that, or we thought that when we were building it, you know, we didn't know for sure, but it took them six days to make the Game Jam demo. They were the rules. So in six, six days, they tested that, and they realized that it was true. And then that was kind of where all the hype came from. The hype was real. So at this point, there's an insane amount of attention. There's, there's interviews, there's press, whatever. And we started to think to ourselves, well, how can we capitalize on this? You know, we all had day jobs. We were just doing our thing, whatever. How can we really make the most of this? And our answer was basically to shut the hell up for two years and kind of go into hibernation. And uh, I mean, it sounds crazy. It sounds completely counterintuitive. You know, there was all that attention and we just basically went completely off the radar. 
And the reason was because we realized that we just needed some time and some privacy to get our shit together, to learn to make some mistakes. You know, none of us were game devs, like I say. Tim and I both had careers in advertising before. Adrian was, was basically a student that could draw. And, um, and yeah, we just went super quiet. We were, we were faking it until we made it, basically. But Tim and I understood something from our careers in, in advertising, uh, some of which we've, was already been kind of hinted at earlier, which is you've got to sell a feeling. And ultimately, like, making a game is, is selling a game. And when you're going to put something out there, you've got to make sure that it's really, really great the first time. So we kind of took a step back. So this is kind of a quick representation of what we reckon we have very loosely, time, kind of, the period we're going, and the hypometer, and what we want. Um, for two years, we, we went super quiet. And for a long time, we've had about 3,000 newsletter subscribers who've had one newsletter, which is basically a, about a week after we made it. Uh, I can't even remember what it said. And Tim actually understood this much better than I did, because for a long time, I was saying to him, we should be, we should be telling these people what's going on. You know, like, where are we? What's going on? They're going to be terrified. The game's just it gone into kind of development hell. Um, and he said, no, 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 no. Like, they've signed up. They're not going anywhere, you know? And we're not going to send them anything until we've got something that was really going to blow their minds. And we still haven't sent them anything. <laughs> but we will, we will. And, and why else did we take so long to kind of stay off the radar? Well, partly it was the boring, simple fact of, you know, setting up a company and, and all of the admin and the privacy we needed, like I said, to kind of make the mistakes. And, um, you know, you guys hopefully know what goes into setting up a studio and making a game. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of fans, a lot of consumers don't. So we told them. So we, we knew we needed a dev blog for a long time. Like I say, I was, I was terrified everyone was going to have forgotten about us, thought we dropped off the face of the earth. But Tim kept insisting, no, we're going we're gonna to hold on until we've got something really good to show them. So we spent a long time deciding on the platform. We ended up going with Medium, um, which, is a, which is an amazing place. And we wanted to kind of push the button only when we had a bunch of really good stuff to show. So we spent some time making the, the blog look really nice. You know, we, we wrote about three really in-depth articles basically to launch with at the same time. And then we pushed the button. And our first big article was a primer, essentially, on why ambitious indie games can take so long to make. So as you can see from the little graphic we kind of, we, we made for the dev blog, we weren't even really talking about us. You know, this wasn't an excuse. It wasn't, I'm really sorry we've been so quiet. It was, it was more of a kind of broader exploration on the philosophy of why it can take so long. And, you know, we used some, some pretty good examples to witness obviously being an outlier, but more like Cave Story, anything you can think of. And um, again, it, it did pretty well. Like, we didn't apologize. We were just transparent. And that's something that, even though we've worked in advertising, Tim and I are very keen on being really, really transparent. So we just wanted to explain our process. Did I just turn this off? Yeah, check it. Anyway, so again, it was all over NeoGAF, it was all over Reddit, it even got picked up by Kotaku, actually. Um, even though they used the wrong picture, this is quite funny, they used a picture of Behind Nowhere, so the first game the guys were making. And, <laughs> and it still blows my mind. There was a guy that commented on it I don't know how he knew, but saying, you've chosen the wrong picture for the game, this is their old game, they've been working at this side, and we're just like, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> but great, super fan, super fan. So, um, so yeah, we, we were kind of braced, you know, as soon as Tim said, ah, there's a thread about us on NeoGAF, there's a thread about us on Reddit. We were braced for kind of torrents of abuse. But it didn't really come. Actually, what we ended up having was a really cool discussion, like in these forums, about the kind of respective merits of you know, AAA versus any development and, and why kind of some people didn't understand it. And there were, there were comments from fans saying like, oh, I never knew, I never knew there was like business stuff that went into making a game. I mean, there were the usual kind of flippant comments like just quoting the title, you know, why does it take so long to make a game? Being like, oh, because you suck. Or there's only three of you, or like making games is hard, like boo-hoo. But then there were people that would defend us as well, which was, which was really crazy and saying like, just read the article. 
There's a lot of Ubisoft bashing as well, actually. Um, a lot of people defending them too. So yeah, it, it did okay in the end. Um, as you can see, over the past 90 days, so that's, that takes in basically the entire time it's been up, it's, it's had nearly 9,000 views, um, which, which we didn't think was too bad for our kind of first dev blog. And then we started to realize uh, maybe there's, there's a way that we can use this. Maybe we can turn basically the hype into fans, kind of convert that hype into fans by, by being transparent. And also, because we didn't really want to reveal too much about the game, like I said, we wanted some privacy. We knew we were going to fuck up a lot. We didn't want to overpromise. Um, we managed to, to write a couple of dev blog pieces and, and have all these views without actually revealing anything about the game. There were no new screenshots, there were you know, no promises of features, just a kind of design philosophy and, and shifting the focus onto some, some other games and some uh, other indie devs. But we managed to keep the conversation going because we really felt like hope and hype sometimes can be really exhausting, right? It can be quite tiring. Sometimes all you want to know about a project that you're super into is that it's, it's okay, that it's going on, that it's not dropped off the face of the earth. Um, but you don't need to kind of hear too much about it and be like, oh, I've got to wait for a year and a half. You know, again, we, we've all got games, No Man's Sky and, and whatever else in development hell that we've been waiting for for too long or just long enough. But either way, it can be, it can be really tiring. And the other thing, of course, is by not kind of over-promising, you, um, you can protect against backlash. So your, your fans will wait. Your fans will wait. You can trust them. Should have probably gone through these two minutes ago. Make hype not fans. Here we go. Here's the quote. So backlash is inevitable when there's hype. And this is actually the, the kind of first incidence of this philosophy was written by Darwin, actually, in The Origin of the Species, I think. Um, and, and he kind of pioneered this method. It's really amazing how he basically looked at every perspective. You know, the, the theory of evolution he was proposing was, was going to blow people's minds and people were going to tell him to shut the hell up because he didn't know anything. So he realized what he had to do was look at all of the possible criticisms that he could have got, look at all of the kind of haters and see it from their point and basically level those accusations at himself and then answer them. And then someone of maybe kind of equal genius has picked up on the same thing. And um, you know, this is another really, really good way to protect against backlash and turn that hype into fans, basically. Our next article, by the way, is going to be um, a really good in-depth kind of super well-researched piece on cyberpunk tropes. So we're a cyberpunk game. Um, and the kind of literary and, and cinematic history of post-cyberpunk, which actually dates back to 1998, I think. Um, so we're really not doing anything new. Maybe that's why we've got 31st in, in relevance. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we, again, we're not going to reveal anything. There's not going to be any promises. There might be one new screenshot. But it's still like a huge area that we need to talk about. And I think we'll get fans excited without kind of promising anything. But of course, you can't eat hype. Um, sadly, you can't pay contractors. We can't pay ourselves. Um, or we can't, you know, go out drinking beer and making it rain on hype. So, um, so we had to do something. And this is another reason why, my, why maybe we went quiet for a while. Because we were just trying to figure out how to get paid, how to, how to make this game. So we started thinking to ourselves, you know, where would it be very natural to take a kind of hardcore but niche, already engaged audience that are very heavily nostalgic to? Where would we take them to to make some money? It's got to be Kickstarter, right? The answer to all of your nostalgic problems. And we probably spent about a month thinking we'd go down the Kickstarter route. And we had it on the website. Um, and we spent ages like preparing a campaign and stuff. But then we realized, wouldn't this just make everything worse? You know, like the hype of a Kickstarter, the transparency. We didn't want to release anything that was, was unfinished. The screenshot we put out, the Cyberpunk Game Jam, it looked, it looked good. You know, we didn't want to have a video just full of bull shots. We wanted it to be great stuff that was actually going to be in the game. So we realized it was going to take us months if we went down this route to even make the campaign to a high enough level of quality that we'd be happy with, let alone doing it. And then, you know, even if we got the money, then you've got to be transparent about how you're going to spend it. It'll take a month to, to, to spend it or more if, if we even got any money. So it was kind of a terrifying um, prospect. 
So we didn't do it. And I think actually it's absolutely the right thing. You know, yes, we had a hardcore audience, but it would have been a terrible mistake because it would have been all that time just not spent actually making the game. It would have been a recipe for disaster. So shortly after I came on board for the team, um, a couple of months before these kind of, kind of thoughts, we started getting messages from publishers too. So, and again, that made sense. The hype was real. You know, we had this audience, there's all the press, and you know, what publisher doesn't love a cheap looking pixel art game that they can think they can turn into a big hit? Even though we don't think we're a cheap looking pixel art game. You see it in motion, it's not. But, um, but we, we said no, basically. And we spoke to quite a, a good number of well-known kind of indie publishers, and, and we said no, we held off. And we questioned ourselves every day, you know, are we just being stupid idealists? Like, should we not just be jumping at this, taking the money? But every one that we spoke to, it was, it was like they were hyping themselves up instead of just talking about the game, you know? It was a lot about their heritage. And again, I'm not, I'm not here to warn about the evils of publishers because we don't have one and there are people, all of you probably, much better place to talk about it than me. Um, but we just didn't have a feel that they were like uh, talking about our game. There was just a lot of hype. We were hyping ourselves up, they were hyping themselves up and it was just like a lot of bullshit and nothing got said. So, you know, say what you mean basically. And uh, it's a simple lesson that we all forget. Like I say, I, I worked in advertising and marketing, which is probably the industry famous for nothing being said that actually means anything. Um, but you know, yeah, if we, if we all said what we meant, publishers, developers, whatever, like we'd all have a lot more time and we'd get a lot more done. But basically, eventually, there was one person, one partner who we're currently with, sadly I can't talk about, um, who, who kind of weren't hyping themselves up and things were just like on a, on a slow burn with them. And over time that kind of matured until we decided these guys. And it was because we started looking at their games and we realized that actually their slate, their slate of games was kind of ambitious but achievable indie games. Without giving too much away, a lot of them were really nice kind of 2D ideas as well, which fits in well with us. And we just looked at that slate and thought, yeah, that's something we really want to be a part of. Because those games don't just have hype, they had reputations. Even though some of them weren't out, some of them are now. Um, but there was, there was something more there than hype. So, yeah, we're very lucky. Uh, sorry to be such a tease, all will be revealed shortly. But, um, so that was, I guess, some kind of information on, on how we, as a small indie, navigated the existing hype. But, you know, how do you create it? So I think there are kind of two ends of the spectrum. And sadly, again, we kind of broached this point um, with Oscar's talk. Many of you are probably familiar with this. Furor. Um, this is one end of the spectrum, the kind of AAA, like crazy pre-orders, just you can get stuff for your money. The game's coming out. There's going to be all this extra stuff. And, you know, I'm, I'm not here to judge by any means because I love Deus Ex and I'm a sucker for pre-order bonuses. But this is, this is one way. And actually, there was a study done um, quite recently by Adobe, even though we all love to hate DLC and pre-order bonuses, that said that pre-orders were up 24% year on year, and pre-order revenue was actually up by 33%. But interestingly, over 30%, so over a third of all of the, the consumers in the game is polled, actually said that pre-orders gave them feelings of sadness. <laughs> Yeah, it's tragic, right? Like, you don't want your game, you don't want the hype of your game to be making people sad before it's even come out. It's bad enough if your game makes them sad, let alone the thought of buying it. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have something like Rain World. Um, you guys know Rain World? You've been following it on Pixsource? Yeah, a few nods. So it's a, a really awesome looking kind of pixel art game where you explore this open world, you're a kind of slug cat. Um, and it's amazingly animated and it's super cute and it's going to be awesome. And basically the, the guy making it has just been posting the entire process of development on the Tixels forums. And as you can see, 283 pages, most of them are fan driven. So this is the other end of the spectrum of generating hype. Everything out in the open, complete transparency. And fans love it because they feel like they can make their voices heard. And there are, there are examples where they kind of comment on an animation or make a suggestion and it gets, it gets into the game, which is awesome. 
But then you also kind of think, well, what's going to be left? You know, where's, where's the surprise when this game comes out? Most of the hardcore fans have basically experienced the whole thing already. So again, I'm, I'm not judging, it's just two ends of the spectrum. But we're trying to find a middle way, basically. So I asked him, who's, as I say, the founder and creative director and, and a bit of an expert on creating hype uh, for this talk. I was like, what would you say? How, how, do, how do we create hype? How did you do it? And, um, and he told me a few things. He told me a lot of things. And I can tell you all of them in great more detail. But to summarize, first visual contact sounds like a horrible marketing term, um, but I actually made it up. So yeah, maybe we can make it into a horrible marketing term. <laughs> it's not his words. But basically, he was just saying, like, the emphasis is absolutely on the first time someone sees a screenshot of your game. You know, if someone can name your game from the screenshot, you've won. And there are some games that have that kind of visual identity. You know, you look at the, the kind of clean utopia of Mirror's Edge or the kind of cartoony hyper-realism of Uncharted. Um, you know, think of the, the, the gothic stuff of, of Dark Souls or, I don't know, any, any game that you can... No Man's Sky again, like... Um, you need to be good looking, but you also need to be interesting. It's probably true of everything in life, sadly. But um, it's not enough to just be good looking, you know? There are so many worlds unexplored yet by games. You, you kind of have to stand out. Um, and the player projects the feelings that they want to have onto that first screenshot. So if it's just good looking or whatever, and I think this is why we did well at the beginning, because it tapped into that, it touched that nerve, it tapped into that thing of, of cinematic platformers and a Blade Runner game and this, that, and the other. And it's why Tim hates MOBAs, um, basically, because they copy and paste the mechanics, they copy and paste the design, often the characters are all the same, and there's no sense of that. <laughs> there's no sense of that kind of uh, special prototype. Now, polish is better than prototype, so Tim says, the gospel. But I think what he really means is, you know, you can be transparent by talking about what you do without showing everything, you know, without shouting into that crowded room. But you better be sure that when you do put something in, when you do contribute something, that it's going to be amazing to grab people's attention. You don't always have to be on, you know, you don't always have to be sharing everything. Keep something back. Because hype is about seduction. And this is where you can start to tell that Tim's from Paris. Um, <laughs> but you've got to hold something back, you know. Let players know what you want and what your ideas are, what you're going to do. But don't give it all to them straight away. Hold something back. And if you don't have any of those things, just be the best you that you can be, you know? If, if your production values aren't up to scratch or you're not going to be the best looking game in the world, you know, do something like Goat Simulator or whatever. Just, just be glitchy, be crazy, but be something that's still going to give that player a feeling when they first look at it, a glitch or a video or a gif that can go viral that they can associate with the feeling you want them to have. You know, it's not all about looks, but you just have to find that thing. And at the end of the day, you know, this is what it comes down to, is having a unique vision and just feeling like you can do it and getting out there. So to summarize, how do you create hype? How do you navigate it? It's different for everybody, but touch a nerve, you know? Find, find that raw, exposed nerve that games have that you can tap into, whether it's, it's not enough cyberpunk games. Well, there's a lot of cyberpunk point-and-click pixel art games at the moment, but we're not one of them. Um, people still want more, you know, find that thing and, and just touch it. Make your hype into fans. Don't do all hype, don't do all fans, don't wait for too late in the day. You know, start converting them, start giving them a reason to understand what you're doing and, and kind of find a middle ground. And then finally, a, a concept is actually a, an old, weird German military concept called Schwerpunkt, but which I think applies brilliantly to making hype which is basically finding the kind of point of least resistance where you can put all of your force into making the biggest impact and having like the biggest advantage. And, and that's what it's all about really, you know? Don't show off your first basic prototype. Just wait until you've got something and then target it at the right time, the right place and just follow through like crazy because that's how you're gonna start getting hype. And speaking of screenshots, yeah. Just a, a quick couple progress report. I don't know how they find their way in there.
So yeah, obviously, that's navigating hype, that's creating hype. But the most important thing to remember, of course, is the age-old adage, no matter how much of it you create, no matter how well you navigate it, never believe your own.